Good evening and welcome to the Mercedes-Benz Museum where today we make kind of everybody's childhood wish come true. Spending one night inside the museum and tonight we gave this chance to some influencers and some photographers to create awesome content all night. I will start giving them a little tour around the museum so they can have a guess what cars are in here and then they are on their own the whole night basically creating awesome content, having the time of their lives and have the chance to sleep in here. In the middle of the 19th century, all the stuff would be transported by horse carriages. So you had a growing economy, but you had a big economical problem. And it was not CO2 emissions back then, it was just horse shit, literally. You were standing knee deep in horse shit. Gottlieb Daimler took the approach to say like, okay, I want to motorize everything. So he put an engine into a horse carriage, he put it into a boat, he put it even into one of those Zeppelin thingies. And that's the whole reason why the Mercedes-Benz logo has like three pointed stars. It was like motorizing land, air and water. That's kind of story. That's like the nerdy Twitter fact why the Mercedes-Benz logo has three elements. Das kann ja gar nicht sein. Du siehst doch! Nein, man sieht nichts. Wieso faden die? Karl Benz took it a step further. He didn't just put an engine into a horse carriage, because that's what you get. Highly complicated, takes like three people to operate. Two have to sit in the back, kind of make sure the engine is running and getting gas and all that stuff. And one is driving and directing the vehicle. So that's not something you want to sell to a customer. That's kind of an experimental vehicle. Carl Benz constructed a car in 1886 and it's the first documented motor vehicle of sorts and actually got sold. So that's the story of how the first car got invented. Gottlieb Daimler needed different things to test his engine in. He created a test mule that meets all the regulations of the motorbike. It has like two wheels and an engine in the middle. So we not just created the first car, nobody knows, but we also created the first motorbike. And if you look closely, that's actually quite funny. No suspension whatsoever. And you sit right on the exhaust. So you can ride it for like three minutes or so until your ass catches on fire. It's not designed user-friendly, but highly fun. <laughs> so that's how it all started, like quite funky and quite experimental, because there was no car layout per se, so engines were put in the front, in the back, in the sides. They couldn't figure out a steering system back then. That's why the first car was a three-wheeler, because a steering box with angles and stuff wasn't invented. That's the first approach for kind of a steering box, but it's basically just two bicycles coupled together because your typical steering mechanism back then was the steering mechanism of a horse carriage, like the whole front axle is turning. Uh, that's not very sporty or like has anything to do with driving dynamics. So they were just figuring out how stuff works. That was kind of the first fire engine, but funny enough, the engine wasn't used to power the vehicle, it was used to power the pump. Because back then the thinking was fuel is highly flammable, so it's not the perfect idea to drive into a fire and kind of try to put it out with a vehicle that's full of fuel. But uh, they couldn't ignore the fact that the pump is much, much stronger with a petrol engine than like 20 firemen could ever pump water into the fire. So that was kind of the compromise. Engine in the back, horse in the front, and that's how the first motorized fire engine came into life. 
20 years later they realized that nothing has exploded yet, so they came up with a good idea to put a second engine in the front and get rid of the horses. And then it all started. There was kind of an anti-car movement. Vehicles would be damaged because usually back then if you had a car, you were very rich. That means you were like a hated person by the most people. But that all changed suddenly when the first lorries came to life. Because now the general publicity has a good use. It was not just fun for rich people anymore. It was like, wow, uh, my goods get in time much faster. And back then, because we hadn't figured out what effect fuel has on people, only um, goods that were like in canisters were allowed to be transported. So the first lorries were actually beer lorries and were used by the most brewing companies for advertising purposes. This was like big news back then, if you don't use a horse carriage, if you use a lorry. To sum it up, acceptance of the petrol engine came because the first lorries transported beer and beer is a good thing for most people and that's how petrol engines in itself became accepted and there wasn't much hate against it anymore after that. None of these vehicles had a reverse gear because a horse carriage also has no reverse gear. So at the end of every road, you had a big turning circle. That's uh, why there was no need to put a reverse gear into anything because you didn't need it. And that's the famous invention because you're all German. Some guys don't know it, but they started to put these funny things on cars. And the word we use for it today is, is Kotflügel, which is nothing else than a wing, which was there that your car get co didn't get covered in shit because the roads were still full of horse shit. And then, yeah, you get experimental. That was like the first van, that was a lorry, that was kind of a medium-sized car. Like all the different car segments get invented at the time. And like also different engine configurations. You can put cylinders there, you can put it in line, you can put it horizontally. It was all a big gamble. Nothing was, nothing was sure and it was still like, we just see what works best for us. And now quick break because the roof is open and we can just enjoy a beautiful view across Stuttgart. My name is Diana. I'm actually just a hobby photographer. I study design in our university. Our professor once um, taught us how to make easy tools. Like if you want to change the color of the light, you just use some simple colored paper and put it in front of a, a flashlight. And then he also showed us how to um, actually make some cool forms and objects. It's just really simple. Um, so the basic is a flashlight, then some plexiglass and uh, tape and then just a simple kind of tube where you which you can put on the flashlight and then with these shapes um, it's really cool because you have the flashlight normally like this and then when you put it in the shape it gets lighted all around I actually wanted to do some light painting like with long-term exposure and then you get some kind of pictures and drawings or um, light up the cars. But because it was too bright today in the museum, um, I couldn't do it. And I was really sad in the beginning because I thought, okay, that's it. I can go home practically. I can do what I planned. But then um, before I gave up, I actually just experimented a little bit with the light and then um, I got this really cool effect, as you can see here. This is all of refraction from this side, so the glass, it doesn't just bring the light frame, it also brings the reflections. Pretty cool and has like a really special effect. Uh, you'll always end up somewhere and most of the time the spontaneous, unplanned experiments like this bring you the best results in the end. In this museum, there are all real cars, but due to security reasons, the fuel tank gets drained and the oil gets drained, and inside the engines there is like a special coating so that they don't rust. 
So each of these cars is in running condition, but when you take it out, you have to get into a workshop, like fill it with oil, gear oil and all that stuff, get all the fuels back in, and then you can drive it away. It's not dark enough. <laughs> still, still not dark enough. It's still not dark enough. But it's a kind of good experience, great okay. experience, yes. It's like a dream come true, like as a kid growing up in Stuttgart, like being able to shoot here at night. Yeah, there's nothing better as a photographer and as a car lover. Eins, zwei, drei. You gotta light paint the cars, which means use like a long exposure and just like shape. The, the cars with our lights just the way we like it. And so what's funny, what you basically don't notice on like first glimpse, the different stages in the museum are covered in the materials that are used in the time. Like copper was the material, and that was like your typical wooden floor in the 19th century. And that will change, like time evolves and so the museum also evolves. Yeah, we're basically uh, around the beginning of the century. Cars are getting more car-like. They are still a bit hard to drive. So usually when you had money, like the only way to get a car is to get a chauffeur with it. So usually back then every car was a limousine, you were sitting in the back, chauffeur was sitting in the front. None of these cars were standardized, they were all highly complicated to use. So you had one guy for driving and you were sitting in the back. I like the concept that the driver has to sit in the cold and you were like sitting like nice and cozy in the back. And of course, when you have more than one car, what's gonna happen? You're gonna race. And back then, uh, some of the rich people thought, man, this, this could be actually a lot of fun to drive by myself. So they kicked their chauffeur out of the driver's seat and were driving themselves. Back then, those guys were called gentleman drivers because unlike the other rich people, they were driving by themselves. Then they were realizing, man, that's kind of slow. They wanted, of course, go faster. So one of the biggest car selling people, which was Emil Jelinek back then, who had like lots and lots of car selling businesses, said, I want a faster car than the other guys. It doesn't need to be big, it just needs two seats for one me and my navigator. I want a race car, build me one. So this company built Emil Jelinek, the blue car, which featured like every single element from a race car you've seen today. Like all of these cars had a very high center of gravity, so they were easily tipping over into corners. So what did they do? They kind of lowered it as lower as possible and put the fuel tank underneath the frame to lower the center of gravity. Also, hand controls were the norm back then, but they put the controls to the feet. So they have like, you have, your hands were free to read the navigation. Your passenger could like hold the card and you could like focus on going fast and not have to do 20 other things with your hand. So that's how foot pedals got invented. Also, the car was as short and as light as possible because they figured out really early, the lighter it is, the faster it will go. So, this car was there and was racing against all the other cars, which was, of course, highly successful in winning everything. And because Emil Jelinek, when he was racing, he didn't want to use his real name, so he used the name of his daughter, which was Mercedes. So this car was known as a Mercedes. And that's how we changed the name to Mercedes. And this car made Mercedes famous. It's not the first car, but it's the first Mercedes. And we stuck with it ever since. So three-pointed stars, Mercedes around. You have your logo, which stays with us until today. Das Auto rutscht vielleicht auch. Ich finde es eigentlich nicht schlecht. Ich 
ein Saugu, das sag ich doch. Singe halt, wenn wir es mit meinem 45er Objektiv machen. Ja, wo soll ich dann hin? Durch ja, die Wand durch? Richtig. I'm, einer, I'm so happy being a part of this incredible event. The whole museum is like a big playground and it's the first time I'm at night at the museum. Usually when you bought a car, you bought this a chassis, an engine and a steering wheel and then you took it through your coach builder of your choice and told him I want this line over there and I kind of want the roof or not. If you had the money, obviously you could just buy like standard forms but this was kind of way popular. So none of two cars were looking the same, it was all individualized. For us, the red car kind of was the first S-Class. That's how your full-spec travel limousine looked back then. And the blue one is your full-spec race car. AMG GTR right there, basically, back then. <laughs> the main halls are always like going through time. And then in this area, you always have your special exhibition, which highlights one topic. This one we call the gallery of travel, like with buses and stuff like that. And there are a lot of funny things in here. Actually, I could tell you a whole lot to every single piece, but I'm not gonna do that. I'm focusing on the highlights and there are like two highlights in here which I want to focus. One thing is the museum looks the way it looks because of the vehicle back there, because <laughs> one um, recommendation for the architect was to make it as high that the red double-decker bus back there fits inside. So that car kind of defined the height of the rooms. And this one, which is kind of the most designed-ish car, it's like from Argentina, it's a lorry, but it's a bus chassis on it. And in Argentina, the lorries are privatized. So there is not like a state-covered lorry system. Basically, each bus owner has to get customers by themselves and choose the routes individually. And that's why in Argentina the buses look like that, because which bus are you gonna use? The fanciest, basically, and that's why they get so highly customized and painted to attract their customers. This is the magic box with all the keys. So jump inside the best looking bus I have ever seen. Full on custom. Sleep in here tonight? <laughs> it is possible to sleep in here tonight. Wow. I also like like the furry, uh, furry gear knob and stuff. That was actually a highly discussed decision, like because this museum is very open. If you want to, you can touch everything. There is no glass or like thingy. But we wanted to do it on purpose. But of course, people like steal stuff. No way around it. I'm the social media manager and when I started my job I was like posting a 300 SL every day will get me like tons and tons of followers. Completely wrong. What people want to see most is affordable cars. 124 series, 123, 126. So that's the 123 series. It's kind of like an affordable classic right now. Um, if you want to post a picture of that, people will like it for example more than a Goldwing. That's why I'm going to open it up for you. <laughs> uh, and because it's the gallery of travel and we are a bit funny and don't take our jobs very seriously, we fitted it up with lots and lots of period correct equipment. So this would be your family travel holiday vehicle back in the 70s when people were like, oh man, I had one of those back then. Yeah, from this window you can actually see because everybody's looking. Uh, that's an excellent view of, uh, I think it was the first Mercedes-Benz test track they built here in Stuttgart. Uh, it starts here in the circle, goes all around there. And it's like, it's still in use today. They're still testing vehicles over there, like for real. And so we have our own little test track. 
here in Stuttgart. And it goes like way back there and there is like a like kind of a gravel course like to test the suspension and all the stuff. Neben der Rutschplatte die Holberstrecke. Ja, früher fuhren wir in die Heide. Doch die ist weit weg. Da haben wir sie einfach originalgetreu von dort ins Werk geholt. Per Abguss. So as I mentioned earlier for a few people, why is the museum as high as it is? Because of this beautiful car or bus, which is our highest example. And the goal was this thing has to fit inside. And it's also what your typical bus transportation looked like around 1900. What I always find funny is the complete lack of any gauges. You were not knowing how fast you were going or anything, or like how much fuel you had. It was all kind of guesswork. Back then, if you want to really make an impression on the Stuttgart bicycle night, in wartime, when the car industry wasn't that great, we also started building bicycles. So if you want a really special, good-looking bicycle, we have a Mercedes bicycle. There was one, and I mean, not many, not many have survived, but if you want to be a real hipster, that's, that's the way to go. As a car guy in general, I couldn't make anything with those cars before I learned one interesting fact, the air on high altitude is very thin. So your airplanes can only climb one basic altitude. That's when they're invented like turbos and blowers, forcing more air into the cylinders and you can climb higher. So that's when they got invented to uh, get a higher altitude for airplanes, which were petrol driven. But when the war was over, now the funny thing happened. <laughs> One guy woke up one morning and said like, wait a second, I have this blower, what does it do on like low altitude? It will obviously create much more horsepower because you can cram much more air into it. Let's fit it on a car. And they had still like only brakes in the back, no suspension to speak of, flimsy wheels, which were highly acceptable for like the 40 horsepower first racing car you saw upstairs. Suddenly you mount a blower to this engine, it creates like 200 horsepower. That was like the peak point of maniac driven automobiles because you have a thing that rides horribly, doesn't stop, but suddenly is capable of doing 200 an hour on the highway. That was a very short time and not the best time for our health system. But like for me, it was the most fun time because back then it was just game on. Suddenly you can do like drive 50 and suddenly you can add 200 more to that. And that was when the old image of the race car driver as one of those heroes emerged. Because when nine cars started into a race, usually one of those drivers crashed. It was back then a job with a high fatality rate. Uh, and that's why you look up to race drivers as kind of these badass daredevils, because that's what they did back then. I always like to point out this handle because it was kind of the security belt for like your co-driver which had to read the map. Um, you can hold on to the steering wheel. That's what your typical race car looked like. That's your typical street car looked like. So race car was just get rid of all the unnecessary body weight, make it as light as possible, cramp up the blower uh, so it creates more boost and then you have a race car. I think this was the most expensive car you can buy back then and also the most beautiful one. It was the 500k special. I think it's like you would go for an S-Class convertible right now and that was like the S-Class convertible back in the day. And that was kind of your AMG GTR top of the pops hypercar back in the day and that was kind of a luxury cruiser. This is the only car that breaks the rules when I told you like the cars that are affordable are highly successful in terms of reach. This car breaks all of that because it's just so beautiful. Hi, my name is Richie and uh, yeah, I don't know, it's uh, half past uh, two or something like this and uh, we are shooting some nice pictures and some awesome cars. Hi, 
Hi, my name is Sonia Fernandez and I'm an automotive photographer. We're shooting tonight in the Mercedes-Benz Museum. I think I have a lot of fun. It's very special, magical, dramatical. It's a new experience for me. I very love it. So that's another special exhibition. This time it's all about lorries. One famous kind of a showpiece is the car transporter back there because when I was telling you on the rooftop about the cars like that when the series ends, the last car gets in the collection, the cars that are parked on this car transporter are one of these cars. So these cars have like literally zero miles on the tachometers. They weren't restored, they were just like off the line into the collection and now on public display. So every car is still 100% original, never had a number plate fitted or anything. Just like pushed the two kilometers on the transporter and they stayed there ever since. Um, second funny thing is this lorry, which kind of often brings the question, why has it two front axles? We were kind of creative back then, to be completely honest. There was a new law, but per axle you can only carry 10 tons or anything, wanting to get the goods back to the train. That's why we fitted two front axles. Front axles because they were cheaper than the rear axle and then you can carry 30 tons again. That was our creative solution to that law. And it's called, uh, it's called Tausendfüßler in German. I don't know the exact translation in English. Um, but I like the creative approach. That vehicle was all about that. This thing is basically a 300 SL. It doesn't look like it. When we were racing with the 300 SL in Europe, you had like two choices. You could pack in your whole workshop and carry it to Italy, or you had a way to make sure that the broken car gets from Italy to Stuttgart, gets repaired and gets back to Italy in one night. So they built this car, which only purpose was to transport race cars to the workshop in the night, repair them at night here in Stuttgart, travel them back to the race so they can race another day. So to achieve that, because back then you had no high-speed regulation for lorries, they used the 300 SL engine, used the taillights as well. I think it does 100, 170. Um, and that doesn't sound like much, but in those days, 1955, your average top speed of a car was like 90 kmh. Then you were like the big guy on the Autobahn and suddenly you had a Mercedes lorry with a car on the back which passes you twice the speed on the left side. It has the tail of a 300 SL so it kind of matches in, in, in styling and also in the materials used in the interior. So it was like kind of a designed one-off race transporter which actually could outrace anything on the Autobahn back then. That's why this car is so famous because it's either very weird because they put the cap so much in the front to keep the center of gravity very low but also it was the fastest thing back then it was a lorry and then that's another funny fact back then lorries looked like this the engine in front of the cab was highly accessible in terms of repass and blah 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 and then in that time germany restricted the length of a lorry to 30 meters you had to figure out a way to gain more space for the load and less for the driver, so you kind of made the driver sit on top of the engine to make a bigger loading bed. And that was funny because like the tiltable cap which you see today wasn't invented back then. So this contraption over there, it's called the uh, advance calendar, the advance calendar or whatever it's called, because it has like 24 doors, like one door to change the spark plug, the another one to adjust the timing. Basically you have it, one door for all of the service items. It has like a million doors uh, to get to the engine. And then they thought like, man, that's highly complicated. Let's just make the whole thing tilt forward. But you had like this funny time in between. Alles Maßnahmen dem Fahrer die Arbeit verleichtern. Denn täglich verbringt er viele Stunden hinter dem Lenkrad. So, and I think a 300 SL is the only car I know of on the used car market where the convertible version is actually cheaper than the coupe version because the gullwing wing doors are so iconic that when you want a 300 SL and you don't have the actual money, buy a convertible. 
currently they are selling for around 1.8 million. You need in your pocket to buy like a Go Wing. Those I think are around 1.5, like talking fully restored, ready to, ready to rock. You want to hear some more nerdy, nerdy stuff about that car? Um, Go Wing doors. Why are we making doors that are so uncomfortable to use? because there was one of the first cars to use a space frame, not the chassis kind of big heavy steel beams running around, uh, short light tubes. And that's why there was no way in hell they could fit a regular door. So they had to come up with a solution and that's why they invented the famous Gullwing doors. This car was successful not because we had the biggest engine, we had the most reliable engine. Back then all the races were like endurance races, like over days and days and days. So your engine needed to be reliable and your car needed to be comfortable. So that was the first race car designed to don't wear out the, the driver. That's why there are so much headspace and stuff like that. Right now you can like wear a modern helmet and still fit in this car. Or in case of Magnus Walker, he said I can wear my cowboy hat into one of those cars and I couldn't wear it into a Porsche 911. So that's why they were successful, like they were reliable, strong and comfortable. And of course very light and that's why there is like this huge thing which you have to go over before you can actually take a seat. Hey Leute, wann hat man die Möglichkeit, in so einem geilen Auto zu sitzen? My name is Levin, I'm working for Mercedes-Benz. I'm a corporate student in international business. One of my hobbies is to photograph people and also amazing cars. Now I spent a night here at the museum with many amazing cars, with outlook in the future, like fuel cell studies, and all the way back to the 19th century and this S11 is an iconic masterpiece and to experience in that intensive way is a opportunity no one else gets normally and I I really enjoy it. Um, I'm not gonna spend much time in here, we call it the special exhibition of helpers. Uh, those vehicles are just interesting for sleepover reasons because plenty of people choose to sleep in the ambulances because they are quite comfy. <laughs> but uh, one famous fact here are like two fire engines and that's a reminder to the story I told you when we were on the first floor. Like in that time they figured out, man, it would be way helpful to put a second engine in the front and kind of drive the car. We were building race cars in the 19th century, then in the 1920s we were putting like blowers on it, then we were thinking about how we can get it to stop and to handle and now we're in the 1970s and the firstly the thought appears like maybe we should do something that people survive accidents. Uh, so 1970s was the decade of rumble zones, crash protection, stuff like that. And to do that the first thought was, man, we actually need to know what the car is doing, so we should measure what it's doing. But in a time where there was no Bluetooth or anything, how can you measure when you have no memory or hard drive or whatever? Solution, you attach this wonderful bracket to it, run a steel cable to the next car, which has to drive closely behind this car, so if this car crashes, this car crashes as well. And then you put your engineers in the back on uh, very secure seats and lots of technical devices so they have a look what the car in the front is doing in terms of brakes and suspension. Of course this thing was going like flat out which was like 180s back then and you are sitting here on your straw seat completely comfortable looking out of the back window have to trust the front driver 100% so that he doesn't screw up your steel cable connection. That was when being an engineer was a really risky and funny job. 
And I like that contraption because we built one of those single-use only cars. Again, much like the race transporter and kind of managed to make it look beautiful-ish. Yeah, I mean, this car doesn't look like anything well particularly, but if you are in the market for a Mercedes-Benz Classic right now, this is the 190e baby Benz. Uh, I think you can get a good one for around 5,000 euros right now. And that's why currently on our channels, these cars get the most reach, literally. If you have no ideas, post a picture of a 190e, you always get above the, like, the 10,000 marks. So, um, I would highly recommend to you taking a picture of a 190e and post it on your social account if you want to get really successful. This is the area um, that are all cars of famous people. My personal favorite, Nicolas Cage drove a 190e. That's like, the black one is his. When his career, I imagine, wasn't going so well. And what I like the most is uh, this car of the astronaut, Randall Scott. And the funny thing is, he kept it forever. And he just kept it running, never restored it. And that's why it looked so cool in this amazingly patinat kind of paint. So he always only did the mechanical stuff and kind of polished it, but never went for a repaint or a reupholstery or anything and just drove the wheels off of the car. And that's why we decided to keep it like that because it tells uh, a story. So that's kind of the last stage before we go into the motorsport area. It's kind of the outlook into the future, which the concept studies and electric vehicles. So that's all uh, what's going to happen in the next few years. I'm Andreas, uh, we're having an excellent time here at the Mercedes-Benz Museum in Stuttgart and we're doing some light painting, which is basically you put your camera on a tripod, which we did over there, and you don't need a fancy one, you can use any cheap one, and then you need a guy with a light and you, you could do it yourself as well, and if you have a colored light it's even better. And then you do all sorts of crazy movements around the car or your object of desire and then you get crazy light effects around the car. Have you done this before in the museum at night? Um, actually yes, uh, because I do uh, special photography workshops uh, four to five times a year. So if anybody wants to join them, you can go to photoworkshopstuttgart.de ah. and uh, join the fun. This exhibition is called Everyday Heroes for like the everyday guy or like the everyday dying guy if you want to look at the hearse. But I have the keys for one car in particular and that's the highest evolution of the 190e. And the story is quite funny behind those cars because back then the DTM was based on real cars and the cars were only allowed to be modified a certain percentage. So you take your production line car, you were allowed to change whatever, I think it was 10% and then it has to be a race car. So that worked until one guy suddenly decided to, man, if I can only change 10%, I should like sell a race car in the first place. <laughs> <laughs> That's why back then everybody was selling like these hot cars. There was the Sierra Cosworth, the BMW M3 and stuff like that to get the cars homologation ready for the DTM, which was like how the Evo was born. Hi, I'm Johannes of NewGadgetStart.de and yeah, from all the cars over here, I think my favorite is the 190e Evo 2 because that was really the dream car of my childhood and to see it here live in person and to even sit in it was just really great. That's why these cars were so sought after because they were production ready race cars to win uh, at the DTM series. And magically I think I have the keys in here. 
So imagine being a father and eating a four-door limousine in the 80s and going for like your, that would be your sensible choice. <laughs> AMG still does it today. It's kind of the one man, one engine policy. That was also one man, one engine. Each of these 500 engines was like hand assembled to perfection to make the improvements you got with your 10% modification as efficient as possible. This one is number 222. We sold one and it went for half a million because you can't, you can't fake them. Each chassis number is like to one of those 500. Um, so they have no real price. If there is one on the market, people just pay all the money the, um, that gets asked because they rarely appear on the market. It changed like a lot. Like yeah, like there was a time nobody wanted them, like nobody. I bought the, yeah. the regular one, the dealership had one and it was like 15 or 20. Yeah, because of the funny looking body kit, they were kind of like people were making fun of you. There was a time like if you want to reel into investment banking, there was a time where you can pick one up for like say 5,000 euros and sell it today for 500,000, no problem. The 80s are coming back, I'm telling you, big time. So that's kind of one of the best views you get. That's like our motorsport area. Today you're actually allowed to walk on the bank so you can take a cool picture of all the cars. Just don't touch it because race cars tend to be very flimsy. Um, what I like to note out is that, that trophies really have taken a step down because when you won a race in the 19th century, that was the trophy. Um, I think they went to the little things you get today due to space reasons, because when you want plenty of raisins, you had to buy another house to fit all of them. And that's the Evo I was just telling you about in race trim and literally 10% changed and it's basically the same car. Just put some stickers on it, make it a bit lower, change the wheels and tires and off you go winning your DTM race. Hi, I'm Michael Kübler, I'm engine builder at Mercedes AMG. My dream car, you can see here right now, the CUK GTR. I called it the unicorn. Uh, the car is very special for me because it has a long racing heritage and I'm a racing guy. I also build the AMG GT3 engines at AMG right now. So I'm connected to motorsport all my life. My Instagram channel is uh, F1Mike28 and I really enjoy this time here. You see a sudden change in colors of our race cars from that period where our race car color was white to that period where our race car color was silver. That wasn't due to design reasons, that was just basic necessity because your race car could only weigh 750 kilos, that was the limit. And when they carried the race ready car to the entrance and, and on the scale the car had 751 kilos and wasn't allowed to race. So they were like, where are we finding this one kilo? And then one guy came up and said like, yo, I think the paint weighed like one kilo. So what they did, they scraped the paint off and that revealed the aluminum bodywork. So it's not paint, it's just aluminum. And when they were entering the race, they were actually winning it. And because the aluminum was so shiny and was reflecting the sunlight, the radio moderator was there and was telling like, look, there are like the Mercedes-Benz silver arrows and it was just such a good slogan, they just kept it. And even when they matched the weight limit, they just changed the paint to silver. But it was all due to the reason that they needed to save like one kilogram of weight. So that was the very first uh, silver arrow. And it's like a funny looking thing because weight saving was done by drilling holes into every single piece you could find because the less material the less weight but it's also meant like you are sitting right next to the transmission so if it explodes you have a problem. Do you want to hear like one more story? Yay! Okay, one more story is waiting over there.
those are kind of not looking very spectacular. Of course, this one is looking very spectacular, but this car I like the most. It's the car right behind it because back then there was a challenge going on between the car builders who can build the fastest car. So we built that contraption and in 1938 it reached like 430 kmh and that's the kicker on public roads. And that record stood no joking until 2015 or 16 because the kicker was of course the cars were going faster and faster in Bonneville and South Flats but not on public roads. And then I think Königsegg went to, to beat the record. And like this car needed, I think it has 736 horsepower and it needed that to achieve the 400 whatever kmh. And it needed that little horsepower because they thought it was kind of aerodynamic, but there was no wind tunnel whatsoever. There was no concept of downforce. So even the slightest wind on like over 400 kmh could mean death or nobody even knew that this car would stay on the road or not just like getting airborne. What happened was we went first and got the record and after that a slight breeze picked up and then Audi went and like the car was literally pushed off the road and the driver died and that's where they stopped doing these records. And Königsegg I think needed 1300 or 1200 horsepower uh, to beat that record uh, because the car was equipped with like a spoiler and was creating downforce and of course was heavier because of all the security equipment. But I think that was one of the longest standing records was achieved in 1938 and was beaten in 2016 um, or 17. I have to look it up, but only very recently. It was a huge story back then for Königsegg and of course we jumped in and said like, okay, after 80 years we are more than willing to uh, uh, hand you over the crown of the fastest speed on, on public roads. But that, was, that is the difference between we need to build a car where the driver actually survives and kind of the more relaxed approach in 1938 which just like, okay, we just build the thing and see what it does. And then, of course, we only want to do things better. This thing was designed to beat the record speed of that thing. Like that was the, one of the first Bonneville Salt racers. It had like, I think, 3000 horsepower like bomber engine or anything. 3000 horsepower bomber engine coupled to a transmission from a German U-boat because it was the only transmission available handling that power. Had two rear axles because the differential to handle 3000 horsepower wasn't invented, so you needed two. Um, that thing never, ne never run because of the Second World War, but that was kind of the most Frankenstein and lunatic thing there is. And that's just the hull, like with the tires, that's just the hull. And the technical stuff that's underneath currently gets restored in the Classic Center. Hey, my name is Simone, all my friends call me Simi and uh, I'm a hobby photographer and model. First time here in the Mercedes-Benz Museum at night. Spooky! <laughs> Someone could say spooky for me. A it's small unbelievable that I've even got this opportunity to get here. My name is Leila. I just came directly from Bosnia for my flight. It's huge, huge, so I'm really overthrilled. night over here and I think I will sleep over here because it's a little bit softer and I will have a good night I hope. Yeah, I'm really satisfied. I actually brought stuff to sleep and then I thought um, I would go home because I was too tired and the whole day um, out and about. But as soon as I discovered this new method, the hours went by so fast, I don't even know if I'm gonna sleep tonight <laughs> because it's just, yeah, it makes so much fun. I can rest easily now <laughs> when I go to bed. But yeah, let's see if I sleep at all, maybe 
I'll just be right at breakfast and then go home and sleep the whole day. <laughs> Waking up next to the race transporter to the sunlight, directly grabbed my camera and um, shot all the amazing cars again. I think that was amazing this morning. So it's uh, 8 a.m. now and uh, I slept I think about two hours because I think I was just too excited after the whole tour in the museum that I couldn't really sleep. But yeah. I'm still very fit as you can see. I would love to come back because um, they always change some stuff in the museum. So I hope to see cool stuff next time again. <laughs> <laughs>